Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Sherry Grunska, and welcome to the Horse Barn Management Show. Um, brought to you by Pro Barn Management. And if you are just hopping on, let us know where you're from. We're glad you're here um, for a great hour. Um, tonight's subject is super fun. We're going to talk about um, employees in your horse business and um, are they helping your business or are they hurting it? It's going to be, I think, a really good hour of um, real talk about this type of stuff. Anyways, um, first of all, I'm super excited. Um, well, my friend Trish, who always helps me on Mondays, she couldn't be here because she had to go to Illinois uh, for a family situation. So. Um, she will be back next, well not next weekend because it's Memorial Day, but the weekend after, but everything's good with her, but my daughter Kaylee is here, <laughs> she's manning the computer and everything, and um, so I'm excited, she's helping me, and so we're going to, this is our first time doing this together, and um, I think it's going to be fun. So if you are hopping on, just let us know where you're from. Um, first of all, before I dive into what we're going to talk about tonight, I just want to remind you we have a couple places open, um, spots open for our barn management workshop. If you're still on the fence on whether you want to come or not, check it out. Check the flyer out on probarnmanagement.com. Um, you can call me, you can email me. Um, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it in detail. It's definitely going to be two days of um, everything about this type of business, boarding horses. Um, we want you to be financially successful and sound in it, and uh, the job is easy as it can be. And uh, we're going to be very transparent with you, me and my husband, and tell you everything, show you everything. And uh, you're going to get my book, A Step-by-Step -step Guide to Starting and Running a Successful Horse Sporting Business. And um, we're going to feed you really well, too, um, both days. So, and you're going to go home with so much paperwork and so much stuff. Um, I think when you leave, you're going to be really well equipped, um, no matter what size uh, horse business you want to have, to uh, navigate it all, especially when issues come up and how to work through those. So anyways, thank you for joining us. If you're there, say hi. Um, and we're going to dive right in. So tonight's subject I wanted to talk about was employees. Um, I have um, employees at our barn, and I've also had the honor of being able to travel to a lot of different uh, boarding stables all over the place, and they have employees. And um, a lot of things with it, usually um, one of the biggest problems is, is the barn owner is losing money um, with the employees. And usually it's because uh, the, the, stall, the chores and everything is maybe not set up as he, um, streamlined as it could be. So that's one of the things. Also, I want to talk to you about all the different types of situations that come up with employees. A lot of good stuff. If you have a good staff on board, you know, let them know. And if you're dealing with situations, sometimes it's really stressful. You have to say goodbye to someone and it can be very hard and all that. So if you have questions about employees, jump on and uh, let Kaylee know. She'll write it down and tell me, and we're going to dive right in. First of all, um, I wanted to talk about the importance of employees um, because not just are you paying them to work at your place, they're going to also change the atmosphere, um, either make it better at your barn, um, or they are going to uh, maybe go the other way, which we hope it doesn't happen, but sometimes it does. And the other thing is, whatever they do as an employee at your barn, um, it affects your reputation as a business. So it's really important to make sure that your employees are on the, are on the same page as you guys are, um, as the barn owners and the barn managers. Um, I was typing up a huge list because there was so much to talk about and I didn't want to forget things and um, I thought I would just type up some areas that I felt are really important. Um, the first thing is no matter how many hours you have an employee work, whether it's one hour a day, whether it's five hours, whether it's full time, the most important thing is you want to have uh, workers' compensation employees workers compensation um, to cover in case they get hurt on the job and 
I know this is not popular. A lot of times people don't want to spend the money to have it. But I'll tell you right now, if you are bartering with employees for a reduced rate in board, which happens a lot, um, it's pretty common in the equine industry all over. Um, if they do get hurt while working for you, even though you're trading for board um, at a reduced rate, I'm going to tell you right now, you're still going to be liable and you'll still be responsible if you if they get hurt on the job. And I have talked to barn owners throughout the years. Uh, one particular barn owner, um, one of their employees was doing a trade for board and um, they got hurt leading a horse out to the paddock and they had to have surgery and the barn owner had to pay for it you know because they didn't have workers compensation so you really want to make sure you have that with um, your employees I always tell people I'm not a big fan of um, bartering uh, with people it's I know a lot of people do it for trade and board but I always feel when you barter with your boarders um, uh, sometimes actually probably more than sometimes in the long run it seems like either the barn owner or the manager end up becoming a little disgruntled because the work wasn't done the way it should have been or um, the hours took less or more than what they should have been and the border often feels the same way too so to give you an example if you're bartering with someone for board and they're supposed to um, clean stalls two or three days a week and into it they find out that cleaning stalls takes a lot longer than what they thought it was going to take and now they're doing a trade for board and they don't feel like they're getting their money's worth off of their board that's usually when you have problems i am really a big believer in keeping it straight and um just really black and white so what we do is we just pay pay an hourly wage and um, i treat them just like a regular employee and that way at the end of the month they get paid you know a paycheck and then they can take that paycheck to the bank and they can come back and they can write me a board check and they still get a discount it's just much cleaner it's much cleaner when you're doing your paperwork for your accountant um, if you have to do quarterly reports uh, with employees it's much cleaner for all of it and so if I could tell you um, one thing if you were going to ask, should you barter? Because you're going to get asked that by boarders all the time. Can I do a trade for board? You can, but do it where you're giving them a paycheck and you keep it very clean. In the long run, you're going to have less headache. The other part of that, too, is I really think when you pay someone a paycheck and they're an employee, um, whether they're a boarder or someone outside, if you're giving them an actual paycheck, it makes them feel like it's more of a real job. <laughs> For some reason, I don't know why it is, but even to this day, sometimes I think people think that David and I are like on vacation a lot because we're at home and they think our life is so easy and they don't see all the hours we put in and how hard the job is and that's kind of the same thing um, someone new into it will think as far as working for you they're gonna look at it more like they're playing instead of actually working at a job and it should be fun I mean it should be a fun job but what happens a lot of times is it becomes very lax and sometimes they decide oh they're not gonna show up to work or they're gonna call in sick a lot they don't realize that in order to keep the business going um, well every day and everything consistent, your employees have to show up. So you really want to create that atmosphere as a barn owner where it is a job, they need to show up, it's important because when they don't show up, it means you have to either do the work or you have to find someone else to do it. And it can become very stressful very fast. And the other part of that is when it's a border, um, there's a unique uh, relationship there because not only are they working for you, but now they're boarding their horse. And um, when they're boarding their horse, and then you have to talk to them about why they're not showing up, or they're showing up late, or they're not doing a very good job uh, cleaning buckets or whatever they were supposed to do, it makes everyone feel a little bit uncomfortable when you're 
talking to them and they also have to pay you board and their work as a boarder. It can get a little bit crazy that way and sometimes I like to, if possible, find people outside the barn that don't board for me. I mean, we have people that board here that work for us too, but they also know I'm pretty, um, I guess you'd say I'm kind of strict on how I like things done and they respect that and they, they get it. I don't have a problem with them. But I have had problems in the past with boarders and years ago I actually had to let someone go who boarded at our barn and I had to tell them they couldn't work for us anymore and that was really uncomfortable because I didn't know how they were going to take it and I knew that there was a chance they could leave our barn which means I would lose a horse which means I would have to find another boarder and um, in all that it's that whole thing that makes the job more difficult. So I want you to start thinking about those things um, when you're talking about um, hiring employees, especially if they're going to be boarders. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, one thing I want you to think about is um, I know there are barns out there that I've been to and they'll pay um, a flat fee by the job and they'll say I'll pay you this much to do all this work here daily. You could do it either way or hourly, however you want to do it. Um, but can I suggest one thing? If you are the barn manager or the barn owner, make sure you know how long those jobs take because the first thing I get calls from from barn owners is they're paying out too much employees. They have no idea how long it takes to even clean all the stalls and they're wondering why they're paying out so much money and then they'll ask us how we do things and I'll try to explain and you have to either say everything has to be done by this time um, and give them a flat fee if they're not getting it. You're going to have to navigate it depending on how you're set up. It's really important because you can lose money real fast um, if you're paying someone every day to do chores. So I want you to think about that. Um, the other part of the job that's kind of unique is that it's a split shift and I think sometimes it's hard to get employees when they're going to be working maybe two or three hours in the morning and then they have to come back in the afternoon. Now sometimes it works out great. Um, in my situation right now it's pretty easy because my husband and I work here full time. But still, when you have someone that has works in the morning and then they have to come back in the afternoon, that's fuel in their car to drive back. Um, the other thing is that we don't we don't can't pay anyone eight hours a day. Well, there's really no need to in the middle of the day right now because we're here. But you have to make sure that you can make it worth their while if they're going to come back for an hour and a half or two because usually the morning chores take the longest and then the evening chores um, usually are shorter. So I want you to think about it. It's a unique job that way. Um, it's not just nine to five. It's sometimes it's early in the morning. Um, it could, if things happen with the horses, it could be um, longer than that. So I want you to really think about how you're set up. Um, I think the thing I wanted to talk about that I see um, when I go to barns and this seems to be um, kind of a problem when you're trying to get people to work for you is you're, when you're looking for employees, what type of employees are you trying to attract? And I have found that getting people to fill the water, clean the stalls and all that is the easiest part of the job. I have employees that can handle all the horses on the property and we have I think right now 38 horses on the property. I have people who I can't have them handle the horses because they don't have enough horse knowledge. So I understand that I have two types of employees here. I have employees that will come and they love to come in the morning early. They help, they clean stalls, do that. And um, But as far as handling the horses, putting the horses outside or in evening chores, bringing the horses back in, all that kind of stuff, um, sometimes those are different employees. You really want to be smart about um, who you're hiring to handle the employees, handle the horses. 
um, that's probably the most important thing because if they don't have a grasp on horse knowledge and handling the horses, um, you could have problems. And um, remember, as the barn owner, it's always going to fall back on you. And eventually, if they do something wrong, it's going to fall back on you and it's going to affect your reputation. So you really want to be aware of the types of employees that you have. Um, the other part is if you're looking for someone like a barn manager who is going to be your employee um, and they're going to be doing chores and they're going to be handling horses, I think it's really super important that they are like-minded to what you want at your barn. Um, through the, I'll, I'll try to give you some specifics without, um, I don't want to say anyone's names obviously. Um, through the years early on we had some employees um, that had a different view of disciplining horses and the thing is how they discipline a horse and how I would do it if it's different and you have people complaining it's going to affect your reputation as a barn owner. So um, because there's so many different schools of thought out there you really need to know and you need to be very specific when you're talking to your um, employees about how you want the horses uh, to be handled. With a boarding stable, you're going to have all different kinds of horses, all different kinds of personalities. You're going to have horses that came with baggage. You're going to have young horses, old horses, and you really need someone who's really savvy and understanding their mind and um, handling each horse according to their personality. So I've had a couple people throughout the years that learned one way to discipline and that's what that's the only way they knew how to and they were disciplining every horse the same way and I had to really stop that pull them aside and say wait 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 let's start all over no matter what you learned in the past you got to stop because this is how we're going to do it here and if there was a way that I was going to handle a horse, whether putting a chain on them over their nose or a rope halter, I wanted to make sure we understood the right way to do it together. Um, I didn't want them, you know, beating the horse up. And I had to make sure that they understood that it may have been allowed at another barn, but it's not allowed at my barn. So there was a certain way to do things, and I had to be really clear. And I didn't know that at first when I was hiring people. I just kind of assumed we would all do things the same way and that wasn't the case. So when you're hiring people, you really want to ask these questions to them and they need to understand that you want correction done a certain way because that's how you do it at your stable and that is part of your business and what your reputation's built on. Um, the other thing is you're going to be, have to be really direct in safety. And I have had uh, employees get hurt here over through the years um, because of something that I didn't explain that they could not do. And um, thank goodness not in a long time, but early on we did. And I had to say, nope, you can't do that here. You can't lead two horses in at the same time. You can't do this, this, this. Um, and I didn't realize that, that I would have to be very, very specific on how you hold your lead rope, um, how you put the halter on, which horses have quirks, which horses um, are really easy. And I needed to actually go through with them with every single horse and explain it. And I think if you take the time right at the beginning and do it right the first time, you're going to have them a lot longer because you're not going to be frustrated with them and you're going to be teaching them how you want it done at your barn. So I want you to be really clear. Do you have a question? Yeah, it's okay. how many horses do your employees bring in or out at the same time? I've seen the employees where I board bring two and even three. Okay. How many employee how many horses do our employees bring in? So, um we had years ago, probably about 15 years ago, we had someone that worked here and at that time I didn't know better and this person was bringing in two horses at once and what happened is one of the horses spooked, 
the other horse fed off that, knocked this person down, and then stepped on her and cracked her ribs. So ever since that time, we only bring in one at a time. And that's all I have them bring in is one at a time. Um, we, I've never bring, brought in two at a time. And it works out really good. It's We keep it safe. And um, does it take a little bit longer? Of course it does. But even with all the horses we have here, um, our big barn holds 27 horses. We can get them all in if a couple of us are doing it in about 25 minutes because our paddocks are pretty close to the barn. So we only bring in one at a time. We don't run the horses in or out. Um, we actually put a halter on them and hand walk them all in and then we can check them all over. So that's what I tell the employees. If you have an employee that you've told them these things and they are not listening and they want to get the job done faster, then you need to nip it right, right away. And you need to say, this is how we're doing it here. And um, you can't take a chance. The risk is too high. Horses, anything can happen with them. And the last thing you want is someone getting hurt and or horses going at each other so i am um i'm a fan of just doing one at a time and lots of barns do more than that um they'll have two horses brought in at a time i just don't do that i feel that it's a safety issue here um with uh handling everyone's horses so i hope that answers your question do you have another one kaylee yeah okay do you pay your employees by the day or by the hour ah okay um, so we pay our employees by the hour, um, and right now, because I'm working at the barn and my husband is, um, we don't have like full-time employees here. We have someone that will come in, um, it's 7 o'clock in the morning and help us clean stalls. We do often we'll have people come in maybe a little earlier 6 30 or quarter to seven to help us get horses out but that's only the people that i know can handle all the horses um and then i might have someone come in at seven who is just cleaning stalls and so i have like i said i have two types of employees someone that i know can handle all the horses and i can say will you put out all the horses for me or do this or this and i can handle it and then i have people that um just clean the stalls and I think a lot of barns will tell me they have a hard time getting employees, but I think if you look at employees at boarding stables as with different jobs, it's easier because I have employees that clean stalls that don't want to handle the horses at all. They don't feel comfortable. They just want to clean stalls and they like doing it. They like the exercise and all that. And then I have people who want to do more hands-on and um, if they have the knowledge or they're teachable I can teach them how to do it and I feel like they're listening to me and how we want to do things then it works out really good I think problems come in when you have um, an employee who maybe has been working for a barn for a really long time and they start to do things their own way and that's not the way the barn is set up um, if that happens then you need to start thinking about having a conversation with them and hopefully it doesn't happen too often but i have had it happen where an employee will all of a sudden be making executive decisions when um, they're not the barn manager so you really want to think that through and um make sure that you have everybody doing jobs that they you know that they can handle and you feel comfortable with so that you don't have to worry so, anything else on that? No, it's nope. just you pay your employees by the day or that. Okay, we pay ours by the hour. Okay, um, one thing I wanted to talk about is, I'm going to go through here, I have all this stuff. It's really interesting. Um, when you have to fire an employee, it's really, it's hard. And I've only had to do it once. Um, like I said, you want to try, it's a unique situation because a lot of times it's just morning help or afternoon help. If it's a border, you want to make sure that there's a boundary in there. Um, and you want to make sure that they treat it like a job. It's never easy, um, but sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to let someone go. 
I have been to barns where they have employees that they feel they can't trust or um, are not doing a good job or padding hours. If you're a barn owner and you have you have no idea what is going on with the barn, with the hours, with what employees are doing, it's inconsistent. You know, if I can encourage you to have um, a second set of eyes come in, a fresh pair of eyes, and just look at your look at your place, and I would be happy to do that too. See how you're running it. See how it's it's going with employees, because sometimes it just takes um, someone with a, a fresh pair of eyes to say, you know, this is where I see a problem, and this job is taking too long here, and. Um, I think when you pay, sometimes when you pay a flat fee and you say, okay, I'm going to pay you this much, sometimes if the job takes longer than what you're willing to pay, people will rush through it and they don't do a good enough job. And I would rather pay hourly and make sure they're doing a good job and pay them well for it if I, if I could. Um, it really depends on how you're set up and you know summertime the chores are so much easier in the winter it is really hard especially if you live in a state where everything is frozen and you're dealing with cold water and hoses and all that yuck stuff um, even in the spring with the mud so you have to realize that the job is so physical and if you are a barn owner and you're not in the barn enough or you have never done the job then you might not realize how hard it is for the employees and boy if you have good employees they're like they're worth their weight in gold treat them well and they'll stay for a long time I won't ever ask an employee to do something that I won't do it's so important make sure that you you know they understand and you don't want them to get burned out I've gone to barns where well I've told them you know made suggestions for them to change things and how they're doing stuff to make the job physically easier because I knew how hard the job was just by looking at it and if the barn owner doesn't want to change those things then they're going to have a lot of turnover. They're just going to have a lot of turnover in employees because it's too hard, it's too backbreaking, and they get burned out. So if you aren't sure if your barn is set up correctly, have someone come look at it. You know, make sure the job is easy because it's everything with horses is heavy. Ever noticed that? Everything is heavy. Their equipment is heavy. The grain is heavy. The hay is heavy. Cleaning stalls is heavy. <laughs> Everything is heavy. So it's really a physical job all the way through. So if I could suggest one thing, have someone come in um, that has either has a very successful boarding place and they know what they're doing or um, someone who does consulting, I would be happy to do that. And just have them look at it and say, you know, is there a way to make it easier? Because some of the, some of the jobs really could be fine tuned and I just don't see it in some barns. Um, we have a question. Okay. Um, so Lauren asks, is there any tips to make mucking easier for your staff? And she means like specific tools or machines. Um, well, it depends on, first of all, how heavy you bed your stalls. So I can't show you here, but we don't bed really heavy. In fact, when people come for a barn tour, I always I'm really up front and I tell them we don't bed heavy because we have screenings and then rubber mats. So I always tell them that we don't bed real heavy and I show them and as long as they're okay with it and they understand how we do things at our barn, um, then if it's a fit and we have an opening, I'd love to have them. We don't bed heavy. I think stalls that are bedded really heavy are very time consuming and and back breaking and you end up wasting a lot more shavings and a lot of barns lose money on the bedding it really depends I've seen we do it the old-fashioned way we use a pitchfork uh, and we use wheelbarrows 
but we also are set up where our manure pile, manure pile is real close. Um, we have a cement aisleway, so it makes it really easy for taking the wheelbarrows back and forth. And um, we're set up really simple. So for us, it's a pretty easy thing, and we can get all the stalls done in a couple hours. Um, I would have to say it would be depend on your setup and how much you bed. If you are a barn that beds your stalls real heavy, first of all, I hope that you are charging accordingly so you're not losing money in bedding, but also so you're not losing money in employees. Um, because to clean those heavily bedded stalls is going to cost you in both areas, bedding and in hourly wage. So that would be my tip. Now I have been to barns where they drive a tractor through and um, they do that and they just clean them. I just don't like that setup because we have horses, people riding, people in and out, and I don't want to be driving a tractor through the barn. I'll be in everyone's way. And we have a 12-foot aisleway, but it's still we're in everyone's way. So we just do it with a wheelbarrow. Um, I have seen it done even tougher than that where people have taken four-wheelers and had a wagon on the back and drove them through, and um, the wagon kind of lifts up, but you have to manually lift up, and then you have to take the manure and kind of shovel it out. That is backbreaking. So I guess it would depend on how far your pile is outside uh, from the barn and how heavy you bed your stalls. If I could say anything, I'd say bed them a little lighter if they're bedded too heavy. And I can definitely talk to you privately about that too. But that's my personal thing. And it's never hurt us um, as far as our business with having um, stalls that are lighter bed. So I hope that answers your question on that. Anything else? Okay. Um, let's see here. I actually have a question. Oh, okay, you got one coming in? So Kristen asked, how much shavings would you say you use per stall? Like how many inches of shavings you would say? Um, well, our stalls are 12 by 12. And we only bed halfway up, so like from the back wall, halfway, and um, how many inches, gosh, probably about three inches of bedding, um, maybe even a little less, probably a little less in some areas. And then what happens is it's my husband likes to sweep all the stalls halfway back and then we put the hay on the ground on the floor in the corner so that it's nice and clean and then by the morning it's a mess all over again. So we definitely only bed you know halfway we put the bedding in and then maybe three inches of bedding, I guess I would say in there. It's it, it's never completely perfectly even. So some would be, sometimes you'll have piles that look a little bit more and then some areas a little less. Um, so you might have some areas that are only two inches of bedding, maybe even a little less than that. And so, but that's how we do it. And by the morning, it's all over. It works out fine. It soaks up the urine. We don't have a urine smell because we get it all cleaned in the morning and it's not like there's a lot of wet bedding in there that's just sitting there. So we don't have a urine smell. Um, I think that's a huge plus. We do have one horse that um, they pay for a little extra bedding because the horse has hock sores and uh, gets them real easy from the way he lays when he pulls up. On his back legs so they pay a little bit more for a little bit more bedding but other than that unless it's a medical situation where someone is, horse has laminitis or other things where they need heavily bedded we just don't bed heavy and um, you know you definitely could bed heavy but just remember figure out your finances because it's gonna cost you more in bedding and in labor and you want to make sure that the client is supposed to pay that. You're not supposed to lose money on that. So you want to definitely figure that out. Do you have another question? Yes. Um, Lauren asked, do you have mats down only under shavings? So do you have mats? Yeah. So we have our original is their screenings under. That's the main base under the barn uh, where the stalls are. Then we have mats. So the stalls are 12 by 12 and the mats are three quarter inch and they're all, there's six mats 
in a stall to equal a 12 by 12 and they're all pushed up tight together and so they're three quarter inch and then the bedding goes on top of that and it's nice because then uh, if the horse does pee which they're gonna and some of it goes down in between the bed in between the mats um, in the cracks it soaks into the screenings but most of it is caught by the, the shavings and it works out real nice and if I can give you a tip um, so when we built our barn, we built it back in 2005, and I learned really quick that anything horse-related is always more expensive. I don't get it. <laughs> so um, we went to a local, um, well, here it's Fleet Farm, but wherever you live, you probably have a local store, um, hardware store that carries stuff like mats um, for ranchers and stuff like that. And we bought, they called them cow mats. It's the same exact thing, but they were unbelievably less compared to something that was called horse mats, equine mats. So we bought cow mats and it's the same exact thing. And it was a lot cheaper. And we had to mat up, we had to get enough mats for 27 stalls. So it was pretty pricey um, back when we built. So if you're going to buy mats, we got three quarter inch and we still have the original mats in our barn and they've held up beautifully with horses in those stalls for all, for over 15 years. So I would suggest that. Okay. Um, Nancy asked, what is the benefit of only halfway up like the shavings and what are your stalls made of? Okay. So the reason we only, when we first, um, okay, so our stalls, we have a cement aisle way, and then the stalls actually go down about three inches or so, three or four inches. So you actually step down into the stall. There's, and the reason I like that is because stuff doesn't come out in the aisle way. There's screenings that are hard packed, and then the mats, and then the bedding. And the reason we've always swept the bedding halfway back is because when the horses go out in the morning and they're outside all day and we're cleaning stalls in the morning, we just like to have it clean. When the horse goes in, um, it's nice and clean. All the hay is in the front. They usually, they almost always pee and poop back where the bedding is. And um, in the morning, it's kind of all over the place. But we start off that way and because the bedding is halfway back almost all the time they pee and uh, poop back in the back part where the bedding is and it just looks real nice it's clean um, in the morning it's a disaster every horse is it's just all over the place but it starts off really nice and he likes to put the hay on the rubber mats to start and you know eventually they throw the hay all over and it gets all over but that's how we do it and we've just always done it that way it keeps the barn clean and um, it's worked out really well um, we haven't had a problem she also asked what are your stalls or what are your stall floors made of oh you're yes. okay the stall floors what are they made of yep they're screenings and then rubber mats and um, I think you can get half inch rubber mats too but if I was going to suggest I get three quarter inch. It's thicker, especially with the horses in the stalls. Always in there. It's a lot, you know, when they come in at night. Um, they're hard on everything. So the three quarter inch really have, um, I think, made a huge difference. Okay. Haley, what time is it? 7.06. Okay. Um, so the one thing I wanted to talk about with um, employees you also besides having employees uh, that are going to do chores you're going to have your barn manager who's an employee if I can make a suggestion if you find someone that you think will make a great barn manager um, but they need some help then take the time and show them how you want things done maybe they need a little bit um, of learning how to navigate people, um, personalities, clients. Um, if you know you have someone there that just needs to be molded a little bit, um, take the time. If I could say one thing, um, if you're going to have a barn manager um, or someone that's going to be doing chores and you're paying them extra for that kind of stuff, they need to be able to handle every horse on the property. Um, you can't 
go away as a barn owner and relax if you have someone that is scared to death of the horses. And what happens is, um, and I'll tell you a story. So I knew of a barn where um, they were having lots of trouble with horses, with the barn manager. Um, the barn manager was saying the horses were unruly. Um, the horses were acting kind of, um, there were some problems there. It became a vicious cycle and really what it came down to is that the barn manager had some fears. She was a little nervous of some of the horses and what happened was um, because she was nervous because these horses were really big, she was over disciplining them and over checking them all the time and it made the horses nervous. It kind of it kind of was just a vicious cycle kind of happening and it, it made everybody nervous. She was nervous. She, um, she just didn't have enough time under her belt to be handling such big horses. And so I tell people when you're looking for someone, you know, you might have to help them with a lot of stuff, but if they have fear of horses and you don't think it's going to go away, then they, I wouldn't hire them. I'm not, I don't want to tell you what to do, but if you have a business and you have, you know, you have hundreds of thousands of dollars in your business, you can't, you have to make sure someone can handle the horses and they know how to correct them. They know how to read the horse's personality. They know when a horse is maybe being a jerk and when the horse is scared, you know, they know how to read those signs in the horses. And sometimes they just need to learn that. But if you have someone that can't figure that out or they they have fear, it's going to reflect in how they handle the horses and you as the barn owner are going to have problems and it will, you probably end, will end up with, um, turnover, you'll probably, it could be bad for your reputation as a business. So it's just something to think about. Do you have a question? Yeah, Kathy asked, how do you handle staff that don't always follow directions? So um, are they not following directions on purpose? <laughs> I guess that's my question. Um, I've had to correct things and I can be pretty firm um, when something is done wrong. I am really lucky right now. I have great employees who try their hardest, but once in a while a mistake is made. Um, they didn't read the board on which horses are going out for the day or they um, were supposed to take off some leg wraps before the horse got turned out. Now you have to go catch the horse because the leg wraps are supposed to be off. I'm okay as long as they're willing to learn from those mistakes and understand that we can't keep making the same mistakes. Medication, certain things like that, I really, you have to have, you can't be giving the horse the wrong medications. Um, it'll all fall back on you as the barn owner. If you have someone who is not following directions because they are choosing not to because they feel they know have a better way of doing it, then it might not be the right employee for you. I kind of look at it, I'm kind of old school and old fashioned. If I'm working for someone, I need to do it the way they want me to do it. If I don't agree with how, they, how they're doing it, then I probably need to find a new place to work. That's the same way with your employees. If you're telling them how to do things and they're not doing it, then you probably need to say, you know what, this isn't the right barn. You're going to have to look for a different job because I need someone that's going to follow it exactly how I, I'm going to do it. You have to make sure you guys are on the right page. Um, mistakes now and then are going to happen, and I get that. Um, I'm, it's, it's not so much the mistake as the attitude um, because usually if someone makes a mistake, they get nervous pretty quick when they realize, oh my gosh, I did this wrong or whatever. And they understand that you're dealing with an animal and we want to make sure the animals are safe, everybody's safe. So I'm pretty straightforward with people. Um, and I have employees 
if they're you know they do a good job if i have someone that's not going to listen to how i want it done then i they're not going to work for us at our barn because i have too um i have too much invested in it as a business and my reputation and i have a lot of money on the line i have clients who i want to stay and if they feel that there's no consistency because the employees aren't doing it the way that david and i would do it then I don't want to lose the border, the employee will end up having to go. So it might sound kind of harsh, but I'm not harsh, I just, it's a reality in business. And if you want your business to be strong, then um, encourage them, tell your employees, you know, let them know what they're worth, you know, pay them a little extra if you have extra money, give them a bonus if you can. If they're not going to follow the rules of how you want things done when it comes to the horses, then find someone else so I hope that makes sense and I hope that seems pretty straightforward okay um, let me see here I also um, I want to just really mention real quick that um, it's interesting the type of employees um, you're gonna get and I didn't realize this when we first started hiring employees, but um, I get high, high school kids, I'll get college kids, and um, then as kids get older into young adulthood, um, we don't have a lot of boarders that age and we don't have a lot of employees, but then I get a lot of moms or older people who want to work and you know they love the exercise, they want to be around the horses, and those are great employees too. Just keep open to, um, you know, who's going to be coming and looking for work because I have some of the most dependable people in my barn and they are people who in their 50s and 60s have decided to have horses again and they do a wonderful job. They're very conscientious. They, they do it the way we do it here. They keep things... Um, they do their job, they're not into drama and all that. So it's kind of when you're thinking about employees, um, that's something to think about. If you're looking to hire a barn manager, um, it's also really important to think about uh, what kind of barn manager you want and make sure they're on the same page as you as the barn owner. The other type of employee that's often overlooked is if you have a trainer at your barn and they're an employee, you're going to be pay, um, paying them to work in your barn so instead of being an independent contractor like I have here at my barn with the trainers there are some barns that actually have the trainer as an employee of the barn and then they give that trainer a paycheck for all their instruction during the month and they give them a paycheck um, you really want to make sure as when you have trainers that are employees that they are on time they're doing the job they're supposed to be doing you know for some reason in this kind of business it just seems like things get kind of um, lax and trainers call in sick a lot to jobs you know I can't come today you know oh I'm gonna cancel your lesson I'll be back you know they have personal stuff going on and to be honest with you, and um, I don't know how else to say it, but sometimes I wonder how they could ever have a regular job out there in the corporate world because most of those jobs, if you called in sick as much as some of the trainers do, you would be fired. <laughs> so I want you to think about that. If you have trainers working out of your barn and they're employees and you are paying them, then they need to treat it like a job and if they're supposed to be there for lessons unless of course it's an emergency or they're really sick then they need to be there I see so many barns where and I hear about it so often where the trainers just don't show up and then then the people are upset because they wanted a lesson the horse isn't getting trained and I'll tell you what happens the trickle down effect is, of that is if that continues to happen there's a good chance that boarder will leave your barn and go to a barn where they can have a different trainer and the trainer's consistent and does what they're supposed to do. So I really want to, you to think about that if you have trainers as employees at your barn. Even trainers that just work out of your barn as subcontractors, it's a, it can also be affected that way too. But as far as you 
giving a paycheck and what you're paying that trainer to do and are if you're paying them hourly or um, per job however you're doing it if they're not showing up to work because of all this other stuff going on um, at another barn or here or wherever it is you know you might say you know it might be time to say goodbye there's a lot that goes into all that and that doesn't happen as often but I just want you to think about it if you have a trainer that's an employee so it's just something to think about um, it's, it's a, oh wow that went fast okay if you have any last questions please ask um, I think you know employees if you're going to have them, we only have them in the morning usually. In a, uh, we have one person who works for us in the evenings here or there. And uh, that's because I work full time. If you're going to have employees, be specific in what you're going to do with them. Um, you might have to make out a list. You might have to show them how you want the stalls cleaned. Um, how you want the hose dragged out for water you know sometimes I think David and I are kind of crazy in how we do things and sometimes we have to show everybody how we do it but when everybody's on the same page it works really well and then you don't have as many things get broken you don't have people doing it one time this way and one time that way um, if you're bringing the horses in every day at the same time then when employees come this is the time they start it's a job they clock in and you know that's the thing someone asked me um, a while back you you know do I recommend a time clock we don't have a time clock but I know a barn that does use a time clock where you actually clock in and you clock out do it. it's a job it's no different than any other job and if you want to have a time clock it's perfectly okay to do that um, but let them know it's a real job you know you're giving them a paycheck and that's why I don't like bartering because then they get this feeling that it's not a real job but um, if they're getting a paycheck it's a real job and they need to understand that it's important that they are prompt on time they show up for work just like any other job do you have a question yeah Nancy wanted to know do you pay workman's comp for employees I do yes so the way workman's comp is um, and I went through well you go through your state um, but I didn't understand how it all worked when I first got it so through our um, insurance guy our equine insurance business he's the one that gave me the number told me who to call how to apply for it um, I have workman's comp in case someone gets hurt and it goes by depending on how much you're paying out uh, for employees so it's gonna be different for everybody and different for your state um, but yes I do pay workman's comp I, I pay it every year so that if someone gets hurt on the job we're covered and um, I figure that into my board so that uh, when I'm figuring out my board rates that's all part of it you divide it all out amongst every single horse and per month and so you know that that has to come off the board rate um, also I do quarterly reports and I have to pay a tax accountant for every year for the W um, W2s that go out um, so or is it W4s I always forget which one that is but so that people can take care of that for their taxes so because I pay a tax accountant for all that um, yes that is all part of uh, the fees and I divide that all out and then that is all stuff that comes off our board rates um, because I don't want to lose money so you always want to be on top of it she also wants to know who does your equine insurance um, I use Excalibur out of um, Heartland Wisconsin um, Tom is his name and he is great I've had I had two other insurance companies beforehand uh, for years and the people really didn't understand equine businesses and I switched to him and I realized I was overpaying for stuff I didn't need and he was super knowledgeable and he explained everything to me so Excalibur out of Heartland Wisconsin um, we also had um, Debbie Treadwell on the show um, two or three weeks ago and if you go on probarmanagement.com you can listen to that podcast 
Um, we did a split screen. It kind of took us a while to figure it out. But anyways, it was an hour of talking to her. She is out of Minnesota. She also sells equine of insurance. And she answered so many questions on the show. And you can give her a call. Um, I forget what her website's called. But anyways, if you, Debbie Treadwell, and um, look for the podcast. It was just a couple weeks ago that we did it with her. And um, she will also talk it through. But if you call Tom at Excalibur, he will answer all your questions and explain even how Workman's Comp works out, how that all goes together and how you figure it out and um, get you set up. And that's he did it for me and he taught me so much because I didn't understand. And definitely when we first started our business, I did not have the right insurance and I didn't have Workman's Comp at first. Um, because I didn't know to and I just thought oh they're helping me they're trading for board and I got smart real quick especially after we had someone get hurt here so yes definitely if you have any more questions go ahead and ask them I think we're about done I'm just going through my notes to see um, if I have anything and I think that's it. Do you have anything else there, Kaylee? No, Nancy just said insurance there was shock when I told him what my tax cost didn't give me a warm feeling. Oh, if if he's not yeah, if he's not an equine business, if it's not an equine check out Excalibur in Heartland, Wisconsin. It is so nice talking to someone who understands the horse industry and the horse. That's all they do. They don't do anything else. They do all horse businesses, all horse stuff. And Debbie Treadwell is the other one. Wow. To talk, and Debbie Treadwell, she, even though she's in Minnesota, she, can, uh, she does businesses all over. She, I think she does 49 states. Um, but, yes, talk to them. You call either one of them. And... Um, you know, if you want the numbers also, if you can't find them, uh, let me know and I'll email you the numbers or whatever. But it's amazing when you talk to someone who gets this crazy business and they get it, it's so much easier and then you feel like you're insured correctly. So I hope that helps. Anyways, I think that's it. That was a fast hour. If you have questions or anything about what we talked about tonight, please contact me on probarmanagement.com. And um, we won't be here next Monday. It's Memorial Day. So um, I want to wish you a uh, blessed week. And um, just remember, if you're thinking about at all about coming to the workshop, there's still time to sign up. It's going to be great. We're going to have barn owners and managers from all over and a lot of good talk about everything, every part of the business. Um, and uh, I just want to, I want you to be successful and um, even if you're having a rough spot in your business or a problem, I want to be able to help you get through that. And uh, we just want to thank you so much and God bless you and we'll see you not next Monday, Memorial Day, but in two Mondays. And uh, have a great week. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.